Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Are you enjoying yourself at Work Camp Boston? Yeah? Well, welcome. I, at the end of the day, say we're going to leave here and go eat, and maybe go to sleep, since it's kind of a long weekend. So today we're talking about speeding up WordPress. So real quick, a little bit about me. I'm Frank. I make a few different WordPress plugins, a lot of which focus on this type of topic. I'm also a professor at the University of Florida, where I teach web development, as well as a few other places where I also teach web development. Now, so why does speed matter? So most of you probably here because you know speed does matter, but just in case you're unaware, there's a variety of things that speed can affect beyond just your site. So one of the things is that speed affects SEO. Now, a lot of the search engines rank higher based on how fast your site speed is. There's a lot of different factors in SEO algorithms, but Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing, all of them put heavier weight on site speed. And recently, a lot of them have been focused on the mobile speed. So if your site renders very quickly on desktop, and then you open up your phone and it takes 10 seconds to load on your phone, that's a bad sign. The phone outweighs the desktop current. So this is, so C affects, S, affects SEO. In addition to SEO, it affects things called conversions. Now, if you're not familiar with conversions, this is whatever your goal is on your web page or your website. So if you want people to buy from you or sign up to your email list, things along those lines. So the term I use, conversions, there is your goal of that page. Now, there's a lot of studies on conversions and site speed. A couple of them is that Walmart found that if it increased your speed of your site, increased to four seconds, it would dramatically decrease the amount of conversions on your site. And also, they found that they found that 79% of customers that were dissatisfied by the performance of your website would leave and then never come back. In addition, 47% of the customers don't even want to wait to two seconds. And then, only 16% are willing to wait to five seconds. So a lot of you are ho hopefully have sites that are loading faster than five seconds, but even at five seconds, only at almost a tenth of your users, or almost nine out of ten users would have already left by the time that five seconds comes up. So that's how fast people are looking for. They're looking for two seconds or less, and most of the search engines are looking for a second or less is the stated goal. Now, if you're unsure of how to even start, the, how to approach site speed, you probably want to at least test your site speed. Now, you could open up your web browser and get a little stopwatch app or something. It's probably not the best way to do it. So luckily, there's a variety of tools we can use to test out our site speed and even give us some guidance of what we can do with knowing, these, knowing this data. So my favorite one is the Pingdom speed test. And that we'll look at that one in just a moment, actually. And that one's just at tools.pingdom.com. Most things will do the same thing. We're going to look at Pingdom in this moment, where you just enter in the URL of your website, and they'll give you a how fast it renders. They'll give you some sort of score or grade, and some recommended things you can change. Now, the one that I I usually always use Pingdom, but this Google PageSpeed one, I also check there because Google has the big, biggest search engine. So if they're telling you something, hey, you might want to look into. It's probably a good indication they factor that into your SEO. So usually I end up always doing Pingdom, but then also occasionally also use the PHP Insights, knowing that it probably is countered towards the SEO. Now, oh, that last one, the Chrome Developer Tools. If you're a developer, you might have already been familiar with developer tools. So if you're a developer, when you open up the developer tools, there's a tab called Audit, where you can run a lot of these tests from your own browser. The key difference there is that the Chrome Developer Tools will run it based off your own current speed connection, whereas these other ones will be based off servers, which we'll look at in just a moment. So let's open up Pingdom real quick, just as long as the internet is playing nicely. All right, so we are going to just a random URL, just so you can demonstrate this. Now, depending on where your target customer is, you're going to see this little drop down of most of these tools where you can select what server to render from. Now, if you are targeting everyone in the world, then it probably won't matter. Just choose one that is close to you. But if you are maybe targeting people in the United States, then you would probably click the United States one. If you're targeting someone in maybe Europe, you might click the Sweden one. So that would just depend on who your target demographic is. For our use case, we're just going to click USA. 
just so we can get to the actual data. So depending on the site, depending on variety of factors, this could take a couple seconds to load. So this one, you can scroll down here. And now, I'm, I'm using the Pingdom one, but almost all of these would work the same way. They would give you some sort of performance grade. So this one is out of 100. So it's saying I have a C. It gives me a load time. It tells me a couple of interesting data points. And then we scroll down. It starts giving you a breakdown of things that they checked. And then it goes into a little bit more technical stuff, which we'll go over later. Almost all these tools work the way, same way. I like this one because it's nice and color coded and it's real quick to check out what's going on. GT Metrics, the other tool I mentioned, has a WordPress specific run test. You can click, oh, I'm running a WordPress site. It gives you a little bit more advice based off WordPress, but it's not quite as user friendly, so that's not usually the one I end up using. But that does have a WordPress specific test that might be useful as well for you to look at. So once you have an idea of what your speed is at, so the site you just looked at was at two seconds, maybe you looked at yours and it's 10 seconds or one second, once you have that baseline, then you need to actually start optimizing and improving it. Now, the very first thing that matters to speed is your hosting. This is the very first thing, if you have really bad hosting, almost everything else you do won't matter. Now, in addition to hosting providers, there's a lot of technical stuff which I'm not going to get too far into, but things such as the resources allotted to your site, things along those lines, are very important. So if you have a really low-end host, they might be giving you very minimal amount of resources, so it takes much longer for your site to run. Whereas sites such as WP Engine, Flywheel, uh, SiteGround, a lot of those have really good resources and environments for your site, and so your site will run faster. Now, the good rule of thumb is if you're paying less than a dollar a month, it's probably not good hosting. Now, there's a lot of hosting out there, so I'm not going to sit here and give you exact recommendations based on the giant list, but if you're paying less than a dollar a month, it's probably not good hosting. Now, another big factor with hosting is the version of PHP that your site is running. Now, keeping the PHP updated to the recent version is a good idea for many reasons, including security, but in terms of site speed, Having a hosting provider use the current version, you can go from one, an older version to the current version and have a 400% site speed, site speed increase. Now, if you're not technical, you might not be sure exactly what PHP is. This is the language of WordPress, and this is usually managed by your hosting provider. So most of you probably won't be going in and adjusting this, but it'd be something you want to check with your hosting provider to make sure you're using the most recent version. So usually you can just open their chat and be like, hey, what version am I running? Am I using the latest version? There might be somewhere in your C panel or your account that you can just see it. The current version being 7.2, the last one was 7.1. So if you look and you see it says 5.2 or 5.3, which haven't received security updates in a decade, that would be bad. And then also any updated to the recent version would see that 400% site speed increase, which would be a, a massive amount. So think if you're at four seconds loading, just making sure you're up to the recent version, you'd be down to a second loading. So I just listed a couple quality hosting providers here. There's lots of many, many great hosting providers. So, but these are a couple of the really good ones. Many of them were here today. Uh, there are sponsors here as well as various people walking around. So these are really good ones. If you're an unsure host, this is where you could get started. SiteGround is the price conscious one. I think they start off around eight or nine dollars a month. The other ones are a little bit more expensive, but there's a lot more to them, so it depends on what you're after. But site ground would be a, an affordable option if you have a limited budget. Now, once you have your hosting taken care of and you're sure you're on a good host, and the next biggest factor is your theme. If you go find some random theme on the internet, which you probably shouldn't for a variety of reasons, but if you found this random theme, you installed it, and it was a bad theme, and you went and switched to a really good theme, you could see a site speed increase of almost four times. It could be that drastic, the quality of the code could affect your site speed that drastically. So finding quality themes should be a high priority. Now, the WordPress repository, when you go to your, within your WordPress, you go to appearance and add new, that's the WordPress repository. Most of those are vetted for quality. Those are usually checked. Not super thoroughly, but at least there's a good baseline that you're reasonably sure most of those are okay. If you find one randomly on the internet by searching for great themes, those are probably going to be hit or miss. So you want to find theme developers that you trust, such as the ones in the WordPress repository, or such as, um, let's see, I have a couple of examples here, Studio Press, Elegant Themes. There's a couple of them out there that are known in the community to be good quality themes. 
And if you're unsure, ask anyone you can hear, ask any sponsors. They usually can recommend one if you're unsure. Just don't try to avoid searching randomly on Google and installing one randomly. It might not be a good thing. Now, here's a fun tip I came across a couple years ago and, uh, from someone at another WordCamp is that they would run all the demos for the various themes through the speed test. So almost every theme in today has some sort of demo set up somewhere. So you can take those demos, all three of them that you like, and you have three themes, and you can do a speed test on each of those demos. Theoretically, since they're demoing it and they're probably going to sort of upsell, they're going to have it on decent hosting, they're probably going to optimize it. So it should be a good indicator of the, site, the speed the theme might have. Now the downside is that there, there's lots of factors in terms of site speed and theme configurations. So it's not going to be exactly a rule of thumb like this one rated higher, had a slightly better speed, speed test so it's better. But it, it's a good indication of whether or not this could be a fast theme. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions on that part, the theme part? All right, great. Now the next step, so we have a decent hosting. We have a quality theme, hopefully. And then the next step is, well, how many plugins should you have on your site? Like how, how many should you have? What type of plugins? What's a, what's a good rule of thumb? And so the one number one question I get asked quite a bit is, how many plugins should I have? And now the unfortunate answer is that there's no recommended amount because every plugin is very different. Every situation is very different. There are sites that have three or four plugins that are very intensive and they probably can't go over that or they start seeing a speed decrease. Whereas other sites could have hundreds and not be affected. So there's a lot of factors. One couple factors could be the amount of functionality that a plugin provides. So you think of a plugin such as WooCommerce or uh, easy digital downloads like an e-commerce plugin or something along those lines or some big plugin that has a lot of functionality. There's a lot going on there. And that will be different than a plugin that might add a single shortcode or a single Gutenberg block. Those are vastly different plugins and that, depending on what you're installing, could affect how many you should have. A good rule of thumb, though, is aim for around 20 to 30. That's a good rule of thumb. Now, again, every situation is different. So you could have hundreds, you could have five or six, and it could be different. But a good rule of thumb, if you're unsure and you get to, and you're up to like 30 or 40, you probably might be getting too much. Now, a good way to determine it is if you're not using the plugin, deactivate it. There's a lot of plugins you install that are single use, maybe like an import plugin or an export plugin, or maybe a scan or a check, or things that you might use one time or maybe once a month. If you're not using it, then deactivate it so it's not being loaded. And then, if you don't use it that often, just go ahead and delete it from your site. Does that make sense? Any questions on plugins? So the next factor here is you might have come across this term caching before. And caching, there's a variety of different types of caching. There's server caching, browser caching, plugin caching. And essentially what this is, if you think about WordPress as a whole, whenever someone goes to your home page, there's a lot of things that has to load. It has to load maybe the comments from your database, it has to load the, the user that might be logged in, it has to load what content to display, what Gutenberg blocks are on the page, what widgets you're using in the footer. There's a lot of content that has to load and even some algorithms that it has to process. So by default, it runs all these processes every time someone goes to a page on your website. What caching does is it runs all of those algorithms and content loading and creates a version of that, a simple copy, if you will, and then it just sends that copy every time someone tries to load the page instead of rerunning all those algorithms every time. Does that sort of make sense? There, there's a lot more technicalities to it. That's a good, quick overview. And there's a couple of different versions of caching. So that's kind of what I just explained. So there's server caching, and this is more at the server level. So most of us here probably don't have access to this kind of caching, but some of your hosting providers will enable this. So you think of the um, WP engines, the flywheels, the page leads, they usually have some sort of like memcache or various aspects of caching that they offer or that they have on by default for you. Now the downside is that if a host has server caching and they're they optimized and they have a lot of configurations, that prevents you from doing anything really with it. So that'd be something there to worry about. But we'll get to that in just a moment. The bigger factor is if you see a host provider has server caching, that's usually a good sign that your site will be a little faster on that because server caching is really good. Now your the opposite though is the plugin caching. And so plugin caching is what if you're on a host provider that doesn't have server caching? So you think of like a shared hosting provider 
Maybe you probably still want caching, so there's plugins that you can install that will do this for you. So the big difference, though, is that with server caching, which makes it what makes it better is that server caching then can run its run the server, so it doesn't have to ever load up WordPress. It can just send that copy to the user all by itself. Whereas a plugin, if you're at the if you install a plugin, WordPress still has to load a little bit to load the plugin. So server caching tends to be a little bit better, but it's only available on certain hosts, usually higher end hosts. So it's not something everyone can consider, and that's where the plugins come in that can do this for you. It's a slight difference between server and plugin, but it's not going to. It's still a really good thing to use some form of caching. So a lot of people use W3 Total Cache. Now that's a. There's a lot of features in that one, so it can be a little complicated. But that's a really good one if you're looking for one. Uh, super Cache one is another one. Breeze is another one. Breeze is made by Cloudways. It's a hosting provider. And what's nice about Breeze is it's really simple. You hit the on switch or you hit the off switch. So it's really nice. It doesn't have all the configuration of the others, though. So depending on your level of technical skills, it might not be enough for you. But if you're looking for just something you can turn on, Breeze is a good option. Um, WP Rocket is another one that's recommended to me several times. I've not personally used it, but that'd be another one to look at as well. Does that caching make sense before I move on? Does anyone have questions on caching? Yes. Bre Breeze? So Breeze is just uh, W3 Total Cache, Super Cache, w they're all plugins that you can install. And Breeze is made by uh, Cloudways, it's a hosting provider. But it's in the repository, it's free, like W3 Total Cache. You can install it and then turn on, and they're all caching plugins, they work very similar. Does that answer your question? Anyone else with a question on caching? So there's the server caching and plugin caching. You're asking if you have both. Is that what yes. So depending on the exact configuration of the server caching, sometimes they're not compatible. So depending on your hosting provider, sometimes you can only do the server caching and not plugin caching. And other times you can have both, depending on the configurations. It's a little bit more technical, so it would depend on the exact implementation of server caching and the exact implication of the plugin cache. So they can be compatible, but you just have to fine tune a little bit more. Usually, if you have server caching, it's just easier not to do plugin caching, unless you're at a certain level where you desperately need it. But it's a little bit more technical, so um, maybe afterwards, if you want to know more, maybe we can discuss it a little bit more time. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. So next is going to be offloading. Now offloading is the concept of having some of your resources on your site on some other server. Now this is useful for a variety of reasons. By default, your server, it's hosting your site, it's going to send all the data for your site, but it's not going to be fine-tuned for delivering some of these resources, whereas some other servers are configured in a better way to send specific resources. A good example is images. So if we go, yes. So if we have maybe images on your website, most websites have images, you might have lots of them. Depending on your server, it might take a little bit to send the images over the users. Whereas on other servers, they might be fine-tuned for this process. That can send these a little bit faster. But in addition to that, they're also usually part of something called a CDN. And this is a content delivery network. So this is a series of these servers that are fine-tuned for sending this type of data. What, ma what makes CDNs really nice is that CDNs are, are a network of these servers spread around the world usually. So if I am, a, am your user and I try to go into your website and your site is hosted in New York and I live right down the street from New York, it has to go down the wire, the Ethernet wires, and it gets me fairly quickly probably. But if I was in maybe Japan or some part of Asia trying to load your site and host it in New York, it has to travel all the way around the world, so it's going to take several seconds longer to reach me. Whereas with a CDN, it has a network of these servers, so there's probably a server down the road from me in Asia that can load, send me the data for your website instead of it having to go all the way to your hosting provider in New York. So that's a, a high-level overview of CDNs. There's a lot more technicalities to it, but these are generally a good idea, especially if you have customers or users around the world. Now, I was using the images as an example, but a lot of these can be set up to offload a lot of your resources in addition to images. So maybe your styles, if you have some sort of download, like PDFs or various files or zip files, 
or even the JavaScript, the actual code that renders a lot of the front end dynamics of your website, a lot of that can be offloaded to these CDNs as well. So there's a lot of them out there. Now this is a little bit more technical of a step, but you could use a plugin such as WP S3 Offload to do all this for you. So Amazon S3, if you're not familiar, Amazon, the giant retailer, has a giant web technology part of their company where they have servers and host sites on, they also have CDNs, and they have various storage aspects. One of their offerings is S3. So it's, it's sort of like this CDN concept, a little bit different, but that's a whole other conversation. WP S3 Offload is a plugin you can install and just turn on, and it will manage that for you. So that's a really nice aspect. If not, there's also Mac CDN. It's very popular in the plugin space. I see this a lot throughout the WordPress community. That would be another one you can look into. They also have a similar setup where you just sign up for their service, and you can install a plugin and turn on, and it handles a lot of this for you. Now, this particular thing usually costs money because you're storing it somewhere. So a lot of the stuff we talked about so far, most of the things I mentioned were free, the Pingdom, the, the W3 Total Cash. This one would actually cost a little bit of money. Depending on your site though, it could be pennies a month. So it just depends on how much resources you have. That one's something to at least look into though. Does that sort of make sense? Is anyone confused by offloading? <coughs> So the next big factor are images. As the web has grown, more and more media is getting placed on the websites. You have images, you have videos, you have various content, but images add data to be sent to the user. So you think if you go to your website right now, or even my site, we go to frankforso.me, it has to send all of that data to my browser. It has to send me all the content on the page, all the text, the styles, the scripts, the images, all that gets sent to my browser. It all gets downloaded from the internet. So it could be maybe all the text is a couple kilobytes or maybe a couple megabytes. If I have an image, if I go out with this really nice Nikon camera, I bought or Canon, and I take this 18 billion megapixel camera and I take a picture and I have this nice image that's 6,000 pixels by 6,000 pixels and it's only a 4 gigabyte file and I upload seven of them to my website, if someone has to load my website, it's going to be 21 gigabytes to download that website. And so if you're on dial-up or low-speed internet, that would take hours or days to open your website. Now obviously it's a hyperbole. I don't think anyone's uploading that massive an image. But images could factor in drastically how slow your site loads if you have a lot of images and they're very large. So things that you need to remember is that you want smaller images on your website. So the smaller the image file, the faster a page will load. So if I have 10 images that are 100 megabytes, that's going to be a gigabyte to download that, yes, a gigabyte to download that website. Whereas if I had 10 files, 10 images that were one kilobyte, that's going to be 10 kilobytes and that will load very fast. And if, you're, if those terms, kilobyte, megabytes, if that doesn't make sense to you, that's kind of how storage is on computers and internet rates on how fast things go. So the smaller the image, the faster the page will load overall. Now, so there's two main ways you can get a smaller image. One is smaller dimensions. So if you take a picture with a very nice camera, it might have a large dimension. It might be 7,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, but it would be a very large image. And on most websites, if you think on your phone or on your desktop, you might not need that big. You probably don't need that big. And there's different areas of your website, maybe like a little avatar of yourself, or little icons that are only maybe 20 pixels by 20 pixels, or 100 pixels by 100 pixels, Loading in a 7,000 image or pixel image would be very large. It'd be hundreds times the size you need. So you could decrease that. You could do shorten the width and the height to match what you actually need, and you would speed up your site drastically. Now another aspect you could reduce is the quality of the photo. Now I know you might think, oh, I want to, I don't want blurry photos or I don't want bad photos on my site. You don't have to. You, most visitors, especially on mobile phones, can't tell the difference between 70 and 100% and most photographs. So you could, you could reduce almost a third of the file size and no one would even notice. So this, this is a general statement. If you have really high quality photos, it, you might not be able to reduce it all the way to 70%. So there's, so there's some going to be difference depending on what kind of images you're using. But if you reduce the width and height and lower the quality by a little bit, you could cut out almost 90% of the file size and see a massive speed increase, decrease in your website. 
Does that make sense? Is anyone confused? Yes. Sorry, say it one more time. So, there's a little bit more technical aspects here, but yes, Redis, great, it has high quality. So theoretically though, it's still, you're still not gonna need a 6,000 by 6,000 image, so you still can decrease quite a bit to match Retina. Now, the beauty, beautiful thing about technical aspects is that you can actually specify different images to be loaded on different devices. It's a little bit more technical than what we're gonna go over, but there are plugins that'll handle that for you if you search um, source set or Retina images in the WordPress repository, there's plugins that'll enable you to do that. So you can have one image that gets sent as a Retina display, and then a lower image that gets sent for more like a mobile device, and that's kind of how you get around that. Does that answer your question? Any other questions on this part? Okay. So most of those, the dimensions and the quality, if you're a designer or if you have a lot of stuff, locally, you might be doing Photoshop or some similar so software to do that yourself. But if you don't, there are a few so software solutions that could do this part for you. Now, this is a plugin. It's been renamed like a hundred times. You might be familiar with it as by a different name. It used to be WP Smush, and then it was some other Smush It or something along those lines. And now it's Smush Image Compression and Optimization. And what this plugin does is you install it, you activate it, and when you upload a plugin or upload an image, it'll do some of this for you while when you upload it. So you don't have to quite worry about doing it yourself. It's not going to be as great as if you did it yourself, but if you're if you're not sure how this all works, it would be a good solution and it's a free plugin. So that's nice. Now the downside, and I'll get to the second recommendation in a moment, is the downside of having a plugin do this for you is that it's taking away resources of your website. So theoretically, if you uploaded a thousand images at once, it has to run this process to compress and optimize that image over all of those images. So it's going to take resources away from the, hope, the, the server and the site that could be dedicated to keeping your site fast. Now, if you're only uploading an image every now and then, you probably won't notice a difference. So what Kraken does is that this is more of a service. So you upload an image, it gets sent to Kraken to run this process, and then it sends back an image to replace the image you uploaded that's compressed and optimized. So that's another avenue depending on what you're after. Now the difference is, the first one is free, because it's a plugin, the second one costs money. Depending on how many images you have, I think it starts off at $6 a month. So it's, it could be affordable, but it's not free, so that'd be something to consider. I did find just today, um, one of the sponsors, WP Compress, sounds like they do a similar service but focused on WordPress. I have not personally used them, I just met a sponsor today who have this. So WP Compress, is the name, so that might be another one to look into. I haven't used it because I just learned it today, so I can't vouch for it, but that would be another one to look into. Does that sort of make sense? Does anyone have questions on that? So, the next aspect of this is optimizing the scripts and the styles of your website. So, when someone loads your website, they get HTML which is the, how the actual content layout. They get CSS, which is the design of your website. They get JavaScript, which is the script of your website, the dynamic aspects. And a lot of these files can be very large or a bit larger than they probably need to be. So the concept of optimizing these is making these files a bit smaller to make it faster to load and faster to download. So there's a couple of ways this happens. Now you don't have to remember this exact word, because I'm going to go over a couple plugins that will do this for you in just a moment. But concatenation is the concept of combining these files together rather than having to have 20 separate downloads. You just download one file that has all these other styles kind of combined together. The other concept is minification. So in these design files and scripting files, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of things as they go through new lines and they have characters and spacing. They might have comments in there for themselves, for the developers. And minification would strip all that out and compact the file down to make it a smaller file. So depending on how big these files are, you could see a drastic difference between the old file and the minified file. Now what's nice is most caching plugins, like W3 Total Cache that I mentioned earlier, and WP Rocket, they have this feature built in for you. The thing to worry about though is that a lot of plugins, not a lot, but uh, many plugins may not work properly if you turn on that option in the cache plugins. So that'd be something to wear. When you have this uh, cache plugin, such as W3 Total Cache, these are great options, concatenation, minification, they're usually just called optimization, but they might have a sub breakdown depending on your caching plugin. 
When you turn it on, you'll want to go through your site to make sure it still functions properly. Because some plugins will could break depending on how they're structured. So you want to turn it on and then go through your site and make sure everything still works. And if it does, that's great. If it doesn't, then you would have to turn it back off. And then maybe work with the plugin developer, open a support ticket, reach on support forms, be like, hey, I tried to do this and something broke. What's what can I do here? Now, if you're on a host provider that has server caching, so such as WP Engine, Flywheel, some of them do not allow you to use plugin caching for conflicting reasons. So you, you wouldn't be able to use those plugins. However, this plugin here will do this optimization step without having the caching part of the plugin. So if you do not have caching, you could use this plugin to at least do this optimization aspect. So I never pronounce this right. I'm assuming it's let's optimize, but it could be something entirely different. But that's how it's spelled. And you can find that in the plugin repository. It is a free plugin. You just install and then turn on. And then once again, you'll want to test your site to make sure nothing broke before you walk away from it. Does optimization sort of make sense? I know it's a little bit more technical, but does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions? OK. So keeping your site tidy. Now, once you optimize your images and your themes, a lot of those are the bigger aspects. But once you've done all that and you're still trying to make your site a little bit faster, that's when you get to this step. Now, when it comes to WordPress, all of the data of your WordPress, all the comments, all of your pages, all of your posts, your users, all of that is stored in a database. And when pages get loaded and various aspects of your site is happening, that database has to be queried upon and load up a lot of that data. So when you have a lot of data, it could slow down some of that querying, some of that loading. Now, not by a lot. It's not going to be several seconds just because you have some comments in your site. It's not that drastic, but it does have an effect on your site. So, for example, if you try to load a post on your site, maybe it was really popular, and it has 100 comments on it, which that's great. But if there was maybe 10,000 spam comments, it has to go through all these comments in the database to find the 100 for that post. So sometimes you'll have a spam attack on your site, and you'll log in, and you'll have uh, hundreds of spam comments you have to go through and delete. Well, sometimes if you don't log in your site and you forget about it for three years, you'll log in and you'll see 80,000 spam comments. And that's not a hyperbole. I had a client that I logged in they had 85,000 spam comments. That slows down your site because the site has to load, go through the comments database, the table on the database, to find the comments for various posts. So you want to keep up with this kind of thing and delete the, de or remove and delete spam comments or your trash comments, things along those lines you want to keep tidy and only keep like the active comments. Same thing with a couple of these other ones. The revisions, if you're not aware, WordPress has this cool thing where when you make a change to a post, it keeps the older version in case you need to revert back to it or whatever the case may be. And it also auto saves and things along those lines. Now depending on your hosting provider and your setup, it could keep the last 20 to 30 versions of your post or page. So these are all this data that you probably don't need. So some hosting providers allow you somewhere in the account settings or the management area, you can limit the number of revisions. So you say, oh, only keep the last copy or the last change I made, or only keep the last two or three. That's a good idea. If you don't want to keep 30 or 40, especially when you're making lots of changes and you have lots of posts on your website, that adds up. So having a way to limit the revisions. Hosting providers will you sometimes have this option. If they don't, there's plugins in the repository that are free that you can install and do this that way as well. Uh, the last couple ones, remove, remove auto drafts, remove old transients. This is a little bit more technical, so I don't want to get too far into it. But a lot of this is just sort of like the revisions concept, where there's just a lot of data that it kind of keeps as backup for you, and changes, and things along those lines. There's plugins you install that will set up data, and then when you uninstall them, they won't remove their data. All this kind of stuff over time builds up, and these are things that you want to remove. Luckily, there's a plugin called WP Sweep that will do a lot of this stuff for you. And this one's really nice. It's one of those plugins you install, and it kind of scans your database, the plugins you have, the themes you have, and it goes, hey, these are the 9,000 rows in your database that you're, that's just kind of taking up space. So using that tool is really great. One of the words of caution is that theoretically it could accidentally delete something that you actually need. So you want to make sure your site's backed up before you run it, just in case. I've never had an issue, but it's theoretically possible. So you want to make sure your site's backed up, and then run it, and then Get rid of the plugins so you don't want to keep a set of plugin active that you're not using. Tying back to our earlier thing. Does that sort of make sense? Does anyone have questions on that part? I know that's a little bit more technical, so I don't want to go too far into it, but does anyone have questions on that part? Yes. Well, 
it, it breaks it into categories, but it doesn't break it down like per plugin or anything like that. So it will tell you, oh, in um, auto drafts you have 217. Well, that, that's not going to be super useful for you to check off. It doesn't have that granular. It breaks it into categories. So maybe auto drafts it probably won't have any issues, but maybe the plugin data, maybe you don't get rid of that. So you can, but it's just not granular as you are probably hoping for. Any questions on that? All right, we only have a couple minutes left, but luckily, that is my last slide. So we have, I think, two minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? This has been a fairly quiet crowd here. Any questions at all? Site speed? None. I'm sorry? Um, I don't know, is this WordCamp posting their slides? I don't, I don't think they are, but I'll, I'll post them on my Twitter. Um, so at FB Corso, and then it's also going to be a blog post getting launched tomorrow on that website, wphealth.app, and that, so there'll be a blog post there with these slides in it, and I'll also post on the Twitter as well, a link to that as well. So one of those ways you should find it, and then I'll, I don't know, I don't think the WordCamp's posting it, so it'll probably be at one of those methods. Was this useful for everyone? I, it's a little quiet in here, so I wasn't sure. All right, great, thank you so much.